programs to ensure that their first small businesses uh, and their employees remain at the heart of San Francisco's cultural and economic well being. Small businesses make up nine out of 10 San Francisco businesses, employ more than half of our city's workforce, and generate tens of billions in economic activity each year. Small business owners and their employees have been among the worst impacted by the pandemic, as we all know. Now, there's so much more work that needs to be done, but I do hope that you've seen through our work together throughout the pandemic and beyond that the city is here to serve and support you. Small businesses have benefited um, from more than $63 million in grants and loans, over 3,000 small businesses benefiting from that, including their employees, in addition to tens of millions of dollars in tax and fee deferrals, assistance in advocating and applying for state and federal funding, and assistance um, uh, in deferring approximately $46 million in business registration fees for 100,000 businesses, deferred business taxes for 20,000 businesses, and giving 19,000 businesses additional time to pay roughly $16 million in fees. So in my role as assessor recorder, I just want to express my deep appreciation and support for you, small business entrepreneurs. Small businesses are and have been an essential focus of our recovery, and I want you to know that you can count on San Francisco to be a resource at every step of your journey as small business owners. Um, I'm just going to go through a few um, uh, slides with my colleague, Marta Yanez. Um, who is from the Office of Small Business, an extraordinary advocate, as many of you know, um, to guide you on the pathway uh, to starting your small business. So before we get to that, I want to provide some information from uh, about the business personal property tax, communication that you may get from our office, uh, and important property tax dates to keep in mind throughout the year so you're not surprised. Um, so let's get started. Next slide, please. So just a bit of general uh, information uh, on the roles and responsibilities of my office I'll go over. Then I'll dive right into the business personal property tax uh, uh, overview, including some of the frequently asked questions uh, that we receive and also how to apply um, uh, those to your business. I know that the information can be overwhelming. There's a density of it, but overall, what I want you to take away is that you are aware that these might um, be impacting you as a business owner, and that you know that there is an assessor recorder in an office who could be responsive to you uh, to answer any of your questions. So um, when it comes to those, uh, uh, to the bill itself, those questions can be answered by our colleagues at the treasurer and tax collector's office. Next slide, please. So just a general overview, um, uh, our office primary responsibility uh, is really broken down into three main activities. Um, I have a staff of 174 people, public servants who assess property values, all real property uh, in the city and county of San Francisco. We also collect transfer tax um, and we are responsible for advancing the single most stable and secure source of revenue of general fund dollars that pay for your most fundamental services from parks to roads, other areas of infrastructure, emergency services, schools, clean air, and Bay Area Rapid Transit, BART. Um, we also grant property tax exemptions, as well as record public documents like marriage certificates. Next slide, please. So um, just by the numbers, we on the assessor side look at about 211,000 real estate parcels. Um, the land, the improvements or buildings on top of them, and about 37,000 business personal property accounts that make up what we call the assessment role. Um, all of that property has value, and that's what we assess annually. And then we apply exclusions and exemptions that are required by state law. So there's about $328 billion of value in San Francisco, and that means about $3.7 billion uh, in annual property tax revenues for fundamental services that I just mentioned. Um, uh, in addition to fairly assessing those properties, we also apply all of the exemptions. There's about $20 billion of exemptions that are applied. Um, that equals about $230 million in property tax savings for homeowners, for churches, schools, museums, affordable housing projects, charitable organizations, and disabled veterans. 
So every July, we mail out our notice of assessed values, which includes those exemption values. So uh, if you are a homeowner, please make sure you review that when you receive it to make sure the information is correct. And if you think that it's not, reach out immediately to our office. Uh, next, on the recorder side, as I mentioned, we're responsible for recording over 200 types of documents, about 150,000 a year. Those include things like deeds of trust, lien-related documents, mortgages, public documents like marriage certificates that I mentioned, which is the most, I think, accessible to everyone. Um, and then the department records that we have, um, we also collect those transfer taxes on this side of the house uh, and fees on the recorded documents uh, that we process. Um, we collected about $345 million in transfer tax uh, in fiscal year 20 and 2021, um, which was an increase better than projections uh, had anticipated. Um, for example, very large transactions were taking place in the city, such as what you may have read about in the paper, the drop box sale that took place. That large transaction meant quite a bit in transfer tax dollars uh, for the city and county. Um, in that case, about $65 million. So still in the midst of the pandemic and economic impacts, there are still transactions taking place that have an impact on how we can better service San Francisco because of the dollars that we collect. So we interact with businesses in a variety of ways. And most importantly, what does it mean for you? So as a new registered business, one of the first pieces of communication that you're gonna receive uh, from the city is a notice from my office to file the business property statement. Um, the business property statement form 571L. Um, the office then of the treasurer and tax collector will share your business, res uh, business registration information with our office. And then after re uh, receiving your business registration information from, uh, from them, we'll generate an account for you, uh, an account number and a PIN and mail you a notice uh, of requirement to file that form that I just mentioned. Um, you'll normally receive that in February so that you can declare all of your accessible business property that's situated in the county, which you owned, claimed, possessed, controlled, or managed as of the tax lien date. Next slide, please. So business personal property. Um, what is it? It's all the property owned or leased by a business with the exception of real property. So the business personal property um, division of the office assesses property owned by businesses and conducts audits that are mandated by the state. So businesses in the city are required by California state law to annually file these business property statements, which identifies the acquisition cost of your business personal property uh, and the improvements, leasehold improvements, tenant improvements, trade fixtures, uh, et cetera. Uh, to us in the assessor's office and are responsible ultimately for the uh, taxes on that property. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's about $228 million in revenue for the city that we collected just last year. So what are the common types of BPP? I've mentioned some of them. Next slide, please. Um, machinery, you know, washing machine, stove, refrigerator, um, your office furniture, desk, tables, chairs. Um, equipment, meaning telephones, computers, supplies like stationery, some cleaning supplies, fixtures, plumbing, and wiring. So there's a lot to document and a lot to keep track of uh, as part of this process. Next slide, please. So here are some common types of property that are not considered um, uh, business personal property and don't have to be reported. And I know this is a lot coming at you, but it's just to give you a sense of what to be on the lookout for once you receive that notice to file. Um, so some of those items that are not included include business inventory. So clothing or food that you intend to sell. Um, intangible assets, what are those? Like application software, patents, liquor licenses. Um, home furnishing, uh, if you use your home as your workplace, the portion of your home that is not used in connection with your business is not considered BPP. So very specific parameters there uh, as well. Um, and then DMV licensed vehicles, a delivery truck, company car, or a food truck, interestingly. Uh, next slide, please. So how is B, uh, the business personal property BPP bill calculated? Um, it's fairly straightforward. It's using the information that you report on your statement we determine the assessed value uh, and then we multiply it by the current fiscal year's tax rate. 
So for example, if your business personal property assessed value is $150,000, we multiply that amount by, in this case, 1.1825%, uh, which is the rate for uh, the lean year of 2022. Uh, and the tax bill for this scenario would then be about $2,737.50. So pretty, pretty straightforward once everything is added up. Um, next slide, please. So there's a lot of questions that come up uh, as a small business owner. And again, I know this is a lot, um, but let's go over maybe four frequently asked questions that we have. Um, all the equipment I use in my business, well, it was just given to me. How do I report that? Well, on your BPP statement, uh, you provide a description that includes the make, the model, and the general condition um, of each piece of equipment. Uh, and that helps us determine the value there. Um, who is required to file the form 571L? Um, well, when you receive a notice of requirement to file from, from us, from the Office of the Assessor Recorder, or when you have taxable business personal property with a total cost of $100,000 or more. So just a couple of things to look out. They will be sending you something when that determination has been made, um, uh, but also be aware that when you have that property that's uh, with a total cost more than $100,000, give or take, and you recognize that you should be expecting that you will be required to file. Um, next slide, please. So another question is, I've just established my business. I don't own much business personal property. It's probably less than $100,000. Do I need to file? Um, well, the answer there is yes. Because your business is newly established, you'll need to do a first time filing. So businesses with less than $4,000 in, uh, in business property value, you're gonna receive a low exemption, a low value exemption notice. Um, low value exempt account holders are generally sole proprietors with very few business assets. So again, I know there's a lot of um, uh, layers here, but just wanna share some of the, the highest ones uh, with you. Um, what if I disagree with the assessed value notice that I've received? Contact us, contact us. Please always, if you have any questions, reach out to our office. Um, an audit appraiser uh, is available Monday through Friday 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, there's an email that we'll put in the chat, which is askbpp at sfgov.org. That's askbpp at sfgov.org. Or you can call us 554-5531. We'll also put that in the chat for you. Uh, and then also, if you just are walking down the street and you suddenly have a question that you don't have a pen and paper where you want to write it down, you want to reach someone quickly, what was that number, what was that email, just call 311 and say you have a question about this and ask them to be connected for you to be connected with our office. Um, you also have a more formal right to appeal uh, the assessment with the Assessment Appeals Board. Now, one important thing to note is that not agreeing does not exempt you from paying your property taxes due because the assessment of your property is deemed valid by law until its change is made by the assessor or by the assessment appeals board. Um, some of you may uh, have had that experience, maybe filing personal uh, taxes with the IRS, had a disagreement, maybe something went wrong with the paperwork, whoops, you're still on the hook for not only that base amount, but also the penalties and interest that accrue um, until you take care of that ultimate bill as you work through the process. So just please be sure that you're um, proactive about this so that you don't have to worry about those issues in the future. Um, but always remember, you are not exempt from paying your property taxes, even if you disagree. Um, uh, once the resolution has been met, then there will be a refund uh, provided to you. Next slide, please. So you've heard me talk about some of the dates uh, in here. Uh, here are some of the important ones. The lien date that I mentioned of when we look at the value of your property is as of that lien date on an annual basis, January 1st, the first date of the year, um, uh, or the date of valuation of the property. Um, for February, the business personal property notices are sent to business owners. Uh, April 1st, deadline uh, to file that uh, form that I mentioned. Uh, again, April 1st, so that's um, uh, something that's passed for folks, but please be aware of that. Um, May 7th is the last day that you may file without penalty. So that's coming up very quickly. So if you are required to file, you have questions about filing, 
reach out right now uh, to make sure that you meet your deadline so that you are not uh, penalized uh, for a late filing. Um, and then in July, the treasurer and tax collector will send you that tax bill. Um, uh, and the 2nd of July is the first day that you can file uh, an appeal. Uh, your deadlines, August 31st is a deadline to pay the bill to the treasurer and tax collector. And then September 15th is a deadline to file an assessment appeal. So a lot of dates, just good to keep them in mind, but always remember, please be proactive. You are on the hook for those property taxes, even if you disagree. So please do make sure that you take care of those up front as you are able, so that you are not penalized in the future as you work through the process of appeal. Next slide, please. So um, there's also an e-file access tool. One of the things we're doing in the office is updating our systems, uh, very old systems. Um, and it's a constant process to make it easier for you. Uh, there's still a lot of work to, uh, left to be done uh, in this area, but I'm very grateful to my predecessor, Carmen Chu, for what she started. Um, so we offer a convenient way for business owners to file their business personal, their business property statement. So you can go to our website, uh, sfassessor.org, use our e-file portal to submit your statement, um, and then please refer to your annual notice for your account property numbers and access PIN that'll make it easier in your e-filing process. So again, on that notice that you receive your property, your account and property numbers and your access PIN so that you have that ease when you go to e-file. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, very friendly staff, they're ready to, ready to assist you. Um, uh, you can visit us in person at City Hall, room 190. Um, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You just, if there's no line, you can walk right up to the counter. Uh, if there is, you just go to the kiosk, push a number, uh, and your number will be called in the order that you came in. Um, you can always speak to a specialist by phone. You can call us again at that number, 554-5531. If you forget, 311. Um, and you can email us as well, askbpp at sfgov.org. Um, our website also includes so much information, so many frequently asked questions. I do recommend you take some time to go over that in relationship to your very specific questions, whether you are a homeowner, whether you are specifically focused on business personal property, take advantage on the resource guides that we put up. Not every county does that, but we do in San Francisco. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanna say thank you. Uh, there's an example of uh, property tax for business owners, uh, our information sheets. Um, I hope this demystified just a touch uh, the business personal property tax uh, and the role that my office plays in that. Um, again, you have our contact info in the link, uh, I mean, in the chat section here uh, with a link to our BPP fact sheet that you see here uh, in the chat. So you can have that for your records more easily. And that concludes my presentation. I'm very, very happy to pass over the microphone to the one and only Martha Yanez, who is an extraordinary advocate for small businesses here in the city and county, um, not only pre-pandemic, but like all of us survived the pandemic uh, by providing so much time, equity, and effort in making sure the small business communities were served. Martha, thank you so much for your service. We're lucky to have you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Hello, everyone. Um, I, so I wanted to ask, do you want to take some questions now? Because I, I don't know if you're planning to stay on the rest of the presentation or not. It's up to you. I saw there was a couple in the chat for your part of the presentation. You're muted. No? If not, I can I can go forward. Um, so yeah, just I don't know, Christy. Do you think uh, we want to take some questions now from Assessor? Um, it's up to you. Um, maybe we should. Might, yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's. We can unmute him. <laughs> Just don't want him hanging around for my presentation if he doesn't have to. He probably has other things to do. Or we can always follow up with folks. Um, who can unmute him? Christy, anybody? I'm looking for his. 
Oh, we'd have to find him. Yeah, there's a lot of people on this. <laughs> so maybe we'll just. Oh, here he is. Yes. Okay. Up. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Okay, great. I'm unmuted. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks, Martha. Um, uh, one of the questions was, why don't we scrap uh, business personal property tax? Uh, that's a conversation for the state of California, but uh, billionaires um, uh, with property are taxed. So there are a lot of properties that are here in the city and county of San Francisco that are taxed. Um, we also have programs and partnerships with the Board of Equalization to make sure that uh, uh, some of the LLC work that's done uh, does not go unnoticed. That's an audit program that's already brought in tens of millions of dollars uh, since we began that program. So I take that very seriously and thank you for the question. But I'm also very grateful for the hundreds of millions of dollars that we receive uh, through business personal property. Um, uh, and it's an exceptional unit uh, run by Tom Swerk and his team. Um, uh, does it apply to home-based businesses? Yes, it, it does. So please do reach out to our office so you can understand the intricacies of um, business personal property, as I mentioned, what is and is not covered uh, as part of the BPP um, uh, in relationship to your home-based business. Um, Jerry, uh, with regards to your application, will you please reach out to our office directly so we can go through where you are uh, in the process um, uh, in terms of uh, you receiving a notice for your, um, uh, your notice to file? Um, will this recording be emailed? Uh, yes, it will, Philip. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Martha. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll continue with my part of this presentation. So as you know, the, the presentation is starting a business in San Francisco. So it's for starters, I, my name is Marta Yanez and I work this office business. We are um, inside City Hall as well. Our office is in room 140 uh, within the tax collector's office. And so basically what our office is set up to do is really be a central point for small business information and assistance for people wanting to start a business in San Francisco or existing small businesses that already operate in San Francisco. So we like to consider ourselves the first place that you should come uh, for all questions small business. And we define small business in San Francisco um, with uh, less than 100 employees. Um, so as Assessor Torres had mentioned, out of 10 of our businesses are businesses by that definition. Uh, the majority of our, our businesses are, are small here in the city and uh, contribute a lot to our office or to our city. So um, back when our office was created, we, we run a uh, small business assistance center at City Hall where you can drop in. Um, or right now we're, we're open for five days a week, uh, back open five days a week, but we are limited in staff. So you might only encounter one person there. So it's best to make an appointment if you are coming down. Otherwise we, we really try to make ourselves really available to you and accessible. So you can always call or email our office and I'll have my, my contact info um, on my presentation that I'll put up in just a little bit. But um, the idea is that yeah, if you're a small business, uh, somebody who wants to start a business in San Francisco or an existing business, you have questions, well, of your filing or or you want to one of our business case managers and we can give you a checklist, which you'll see when I pull up my presentation, kind of what that looks like. Um, our services are really customized based on kind of what you're doing. Um, your specific type of business will outline what's going to be required and kind of the steps and the order that you need to do things in. And we always uh, will continue to be there for you um, as you, you know, first start your business, but maybe are growing your business. You have other questions. Maybe later you're looking to hire employees. You might have some follow-up questions with regard to employment laws that you need to know about anything um, small business related as someone doing business here keep our um, information handy come on down visit us call us email us etc um, that's kind of our bread and butter we also do um, not provide some services ourselves so uh, one of the things that we like to encourage people to do as they're looking to start a business in the city is hopefully take some entrepreneurship training programs um, develop a business plan 
Uh, we encourage people to take the time to really research the type of business that they're doing and go and get some assistance. So we don't provide that service ourselves in-house, but we do have a great network of um, organizations here in San Francisco that do provide a lot of that technical assistance and training. A lot of those services are free. So the great thing about San Francisco is a lot of people do complain, you know, it's maybe harder to do business here. It's more expensive to do business here. But at the same time, San Francisco, there is no other city that I know of um, that provides provides as many resources to small businesses that want to start up in San Francisco as San Francisco does. We're often getting calls from a lot of other um, places or people inquiring, do you know if there's a similar office to your office in Oakland or LA or other places? And so that's one thing that I can um, share with you that San Francisco does do a really good um, uh, effort at supporting small businesses that work here. And in fact, back when our office started in 2008, we opened up our assistance center at City Hall. Uh, at the time, San Francisco was passing laws that were ultimately gonna impact small business owners, one of them being the healthcare security ordinance. So well before the state or the federal government had a mandate to provide healthcare uh, for employers, for employees, uh, San Francisco was passing a law employers of 20 or more employees to provide health coverage to their employees. Um, we also have the paid sick leave ordinance. So well before the state passed the health sick leave, I'm sorry, the paid sick leave ordinance, uh, San Francisco was passing a law that required uh, businesses to provide paid time off to their employees. And so understanding that, the, the, you know, San Francisco requests and asks a lot on the back of small businesses, we wanted to have this assistance center where you can come in and get support and assistance from the city as well. So that's a little background about our office. Um, but again, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Um, so this uh, is going to be an overview of kind of general I, uh, requirements needed to do business in San Francisco. Um, there's gonna be some basic requirements of anyone that does business in San Francisco. And then um, some potential additional requirements based on your specific type of business that you do. So um, this is my presentation, which again, we will be sharing with everyone who's on this call today. Um, this is my contact information here and our office information on this front first slide here. So a little bit uh, about us, a little bit more about us. We are all a division with uh, the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and we are also overseen by a small business commission. The commission is a seven member body that's appointed by the mayor and the board of supervisors, and they meet regularly at City Hall uh, to review policy and law uh, legislation that's being introduced by the mayor or the board of supervisors that might ultimately impact small businesses that operate in San Francisco. This small business commission, which is a voluntary group of seven, um, these are generally small business owners themselves or somehow work with the small business community. They meet regularly to review uh, that policy or law that's being introduced by the board or the mayor uh, or sometimes departments as well that might ultimately impact small businesses that operate here and they make recommendations on and that policy and law. Um, you can follow their meetings uh, if you visit our website, which again, my contact info is on the front here, um, including our website or yeah, um, you can find when they meet. Uh, but again, we are located inside City Hall. We like to consider ourselves a central point for small business information. We do provide one-on-one -on -one case management assistance. Um, we provide services in English, Spanish, Cantonese, and Mandarin by ourselves, um, case managers such as myself and my colleague, and other languages are available using language line interpretation services. And we also manage the San Francisco business portal. So some of you might have already visited our business portal. It is an online presence that we have um, that you can access 24 seven that provides assistance or provides information on, on doing business and starting a business in San Francisco. So I would also encourage you to visit that. Um, but we are on the back side of that. We answer questions uh, with respect to um, people that are answering or that are asking questions on that portal. Additional services offered. Um, basically, one of the first things that you have to do when you think about starting a business in San Francisco, besides again, you know, developing a business plan and working with someone to help you develop a business plan or taking some business classes. One of the first decisions that you'll have to make is how to set up your business. Uh, so you might have heard of sole proprietor versus a general partnership versus a corporation versus an LLC. Those are all different types of business entity structures. And so um, we do provide a general overview of um, 
the various types of business structures, but ultimately it is a conversation that you'll likely wanna have with a tax professional and or a business lawyer, but we do provide a general overview and I'll have an entity comparison table a little bit further in the, in the presentation that we can review real quick. Um, we also provide that checklist, a customized checklist of requirements for starting your business here. So again, our services are really customized. Um, to particularly what you're doing, kind of at what stage you're at with what you're doing. Uh, maybe, like I said, you'll you'll need to take some classes and, and work on developing a business plan, or maybe you've already, you're coming to, by the time that you come to us, you've already signed your lease and just need to get going, then we can um, help you really at whatever stage you're in, uh, but making sure that you are aware of resources that are available that can continue to help you grow your business. Uh, we also provide information and assistance with a lot of these filings. So if you do decide on uh, creating an LLC or a corporation, we can guide you in terms of the steps to do that. Uh, we also provide information, obviously, with respect to the San Francisco requirements. So anyone doing business in San Francisco will have to have a business registration. Um, and we assist with that filing as well as answering questions about renewal. Actually, this month, um, May, is the month that all businesses that are already registered in the city are renewing their registration. The registration uh, renewal needs to happen by the last day of May. And so we also provide information on um, when it's time to renew. We provide assistance with renewals. Uh, we also provide assistance with uh, paying your license fees. So some businesses uh, will also have uh, operational licenses to, to, do, to operate here in the city. Um, and so we also provide assistance with that and making updates to your account. Um, we also provide information on the process to file a fictitious business name. And I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more and explain what that is. I know I'm kind of covering a lot right now, but um, once I show you the checklist, uh, some of Become a little bit more clear and we can go through them a little bit more in detail uh so yeah basically a fictitious business name is um is something that is required if you are doing business under a name that's not your legal name and so we provide provide assistance with that filing as well with the city and we also help with, um figuring out what other permits and licenses are required but and also in some cases helping you file and apply for those additional regulatory license um from others, the city, mostly state um, agencies as well. <clears throat> we also provide assistance with um, helping you check the zoning and the land use. So anytime somebody's going to be starting a business, it's gonna require them to uh, lease commercial property here in the city to run their business. Uh, we, we always encourage you that you never, ever, ever sign a lease before you first consult and check the zoning of that property. Uh, a lot of times people do come to us after the fact, they've already signed the lease and then they come to find out that they need special permits to be able to operate their business in that space. So we want to catch you before that happens and we want to help you confirm that the zoning permits the use. So we do that, we, we provide that assistance. We uh, rely also on, on our colleagues at some of our other CD departments to help um, with some of this as well. But we've gotten pretty good at, at looking at the zoning control tables and kind of giving you a sense of whether your particular type of business is allowed in that space or not. Um, so we provide that type of a service. We also review accessibility laws and considerations. So again, for those of you who might be looking to lease commercial property to run your business out of, um, you want to be mindful that there are accessibility laws. Um, so your place generally has to be accessible to people with disabilities. Otherwise you can run the risk of being sued. And so we uh, provide an overview of some of those laws and important considerations to consider as you're looking at a particular property. Uh, sometimes we'll pull up Google map at the property with you and give you some um, information and assistance. And there's also other other uh, organizations or folks who can assist you better assess a, a specific um, location. I could talk a little bit more about that again also. Um, we also provide assistance with, if you're wanting to do business with a city, you do have to be registered as a city uh, vendor supplier. And so we provide some assistance and guidance with that process. Also becoming a local business enterprise. Um, the city has a, a local business enterprise certification. So if you are based in San Francisco, um, it's your principal place of business, then you can get certified as a local business. And uh, the city, when they issue contracts, have 
uh, where they indicate that they will give a preference to a business who's local. Uh, so with that process as well. We provide review of city labor laws and compliance. So like I mentioned earlier, the, the city's paid, um, paid sick leave ordinance. Uh, we have the minimum wage um, higher here in San Francisco than the state. We also have the healthcare security ordinance. Some of these apply whether you have one employee or some others apply once you have five or 20. So we provide some guidance with respect to our city labor laws. Um, and then we also do the referral to technical assistance providers. So basically anything that we can't assist you with, such as business planning, um, business training, um, business advising, looking at your financials, that sort of stuff, we rely on a network of organizations that we can refer you to, including legal organizations. So if you need someone to help you review a lease um, or a contract, there are legal organizations as well that you can avail yourself of for free or low cost, and we can provide you a referral and information about um, those providers that are available, many of them, like I said, free, um, available to you. And then we also provide information on city programs and funding options. So as uh, Assessor Torres had mentioned, the city has had a number of programs available during the whole pandemic, um, grant programs, loan programs, both local, state, and federal. And our office has really been getting the information out about all of those various programs, lot, many who have you know, come and gone. So right now, we only have a couple of grant programs through the city that I'll also mention towards the end. Um, but yeah, one thing that I would encourage you to do is to subscribe to our newsletter. Our newsletter is gonna be the best way to stay informed of any new programming that, uh, that the city will have available. And sometimes we also find out about other state programs. Um, there was a state uh, grant sample in pandemic. Um, and um, so yeah, our office has been getting out information about various programs. Uh, and there's others, not just during the pandemic, but uh, we have, um, for instance, a Jobs Now program that's been around for gosh, more than 10 years. Um, that program started um, uh, the last economic downturn. Uh, the city was trying to get people, residents back to work. And so was helping to pay the wages of employees for employers through this Jobs Now program. So that's just another example of city programs that our office informs businesses about. Um, but going forward, this uh, next slide is just a quick overview of kind of uh, the steps on starting a business. Uh, so one, work on creating a business plan. Uh, people, we find that people who do take the time to create a business plan and take um, training are going to be more successful in their business because they've actually you know, been able to think about their business and plan it out, looking at financials, expenses, um, et cetera. So it is really good exercise. Um, and there's tools that you can access online as well. But there's also the nonprofit partners that we, we can refer you to that uh, provide some training. Uh, for instance, one organization is called Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center. They have a 12-week business planning class that you can sign up for. Um, that's just one example. We have others. And at the end of our slide, we will have a, a list of resources. Um, you also want to, again, think about your business structure, uh, secure financing, file your articles of organization, if applicable, if you're going that route, obtain an employee identification number, again, if applicable, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, register your business with San Francisco. So that's one thing, anybody doing business in San Francisco must be registered with the city. Um, but you know, sometimes if you're not forming an LLC or corporation, you won't need to file your articles. Um, file a fictitious business name, obtain, and obtain other permits and licenses if applicable and comply. Basically stay compliant, make sure that you're renewing your, your registration, you're staying on top of your uh, business property statement as um, Assessor Torres had mentioned. So um, the next slide in my presentation is um, an entity comparison table. I hope you guys can see this okay. It's a little small, but basically this is um, just to provide you a visual of the various um, organization structures that there are to choose from. I mentioned sole proprietor, general partnership, limited partnership, um, corporation, limited liability company. So rule of thumb here is um, the less risky your business is and the less you have to lose, the more you might be able to operate as a solar. But if there's 
um, more risk in your business and you have personal assets, then you might want to consider a more formal type of business structure, such as a limited liability company or an S corporation. Those are the two um, more common ones that we see for small businesses who are concerned about risk and liability. Um, this is, again, is a conversation that really that you want to have with a tax professional and a business uh, lawyer, because ultimately uh, you can be tax different. Um, if you organize a sole proprietorship, you're basically reporting any income from your business on your personal tax, you don't have separate tax filings. However, if you're a corporation or LLC, you may have separate tax filings. So we don't provide um, that type of guidance through our assistance center, uh, but we can refer you to organizations that you can, where you can get more information. There's also a lot of information online, uh, but this is ultimately one of the first decisions that you're going to make before you start registering your business because um, when you begin or want to start registering your business you'll start to see the applications will ask you okay what type of organization are you who's registered um, uh, the, the way that I like to explain this or to think about this is that um, a sole proprietor based to the individual there is no separation between you and your business if you're a sole proprietor so you are personally liable uh, whereas with the LLC or a corporation, you're you're separating yourself from the business. You're almost creating like a separate entity that's going to exist separate from you. I, I, like, uh, I like to suggest that people think of these almost like another person. And you might have heard of corporations referred to as um, as a person. Um, it is good just to think about it in that way because I think it makes it easier to um, going forward to. Uh, to when you're filing forms, et cetera. So when you, if you're gonna form an LLC or corporation, you will need to come up with a name for that entity and um, can also have its own tax number. So for individuals, we have our legal name and we have our, usually our social security number. Or if we cannot get a social security number, some of us might have an individual taxpayer ID number. So the corporation and the LLC, it's gonna have its own legal name. You're gonna basically create it. And then you're going to uh, request a tax number for that entity. Um, so again, this entity comparison table just looks at some of the characteristics. Um, the big difference here is that sole proprietors no state filing required corporations and LLCs are required to um, file with the state. So that's going to be one of your first steps is to uh, create your entity with the state. So I'm going to go forward here and get to our checklist. Um, and I know I'm going fast. What I'll say is that just follow us um, directly one on one, happy to schedule appointments, um, talk to you by phone uh, on your specific situation or help answer any questions. And I will leave some time at the end to help answer some questions as well. So this is our checklist that we use um, if you were to come in or to guide our conversation with you. The first page on the left, I'm going to see if I could zoom in here. Um, Let's see if you can. Okay, so the first uh, box on the top left, you'll see says zoning. And we put this front and center only because uh, for those of you who are going to be leasing commercial property, we don't want you to miss this step. We want to ensure that you are confirming the zoning before you sign in that lease. Um, but otherwise, the next box, um, and we can go back to that a little bit, but the next box essentially is where for those of you who will do Create a corporation. Your first step is going to be here in this box on the left that says Corporation LLC LLP filing. This is done with the California Secretary of State. There is an online uh, filing that you can do on that website. So the idea with these boxes is that you know it's got the agency name and their contact info, their website where you can do a lot of these filings. There's information here on the right of this box that talks about a little bit about the fees um, that you'll be required to pay. So for those of you forming or organizing a LLC, the initial filing fee is going to be $70. For those of you looking to organize, create a corporation, the initial filing fee will be $100. Um, there's also another form that needs to be filed within 90 days of filing your original articles of organization or articles of incorporation, um, something called the Statement of Information. That's what this SI stands for. And the Statement of Information for the LLC is $20, $25 for the corporation. 
And then also the big fee with having a corporation or an LLC is that they must pay an annual, minimum annual $800 tax to the Franchise Tax Board. So this is something that you want to consider. I find oftentimes people come in because maybe their friend or their cousin, somebody told them, oh yeah, go, you need an LLC. You should operate as an LLC. Um, maybe that worked for them. It might not be necessary for you. And a lot of times they don't factor in uh, the fact that there is this minimum $800 tax that is due. Usually this $800 is due within the first four months of forming your LLC or corporation. Sorry, no, your LLC corporations have always had their first year tax waived. Um, more recently, because of the pandemic, Governor Newsom signed a bill that is um, waiving the first year LLC fee. So somebody who's forming an LLC this month in May, normally their $800 would have been due May, June, July, August, by August 15th. Um, in this case, they that $800 won't be due until April of next year. Um, so that's a good thing. But, um, but that is something to consider. And there's just also more formalities with having an LLC in a corporation that you don't have with the sole proprietor. So you will need to, uh, again, file that statement of information I think it's every other year. So if you're organizing your LLC or corporation this year in 2022, the statement of information will be due within the first 90 days, but then also every even year. Um, and so just more maintenance uh, that you'll want to stay on top of. One thing that I will say is that during the pandemic, when people, businesses were uh, looking for financing and applying for grants and loans, one thing that we've discovered is that a lot of folks, um, their LLC was, or their corporation was not in good standing with the state because they had fi failed to file. And so they um, unfortunately were not eligible for some of that funding. Um, or another thing that we encountered is uh, sometimes people, the way that they were registered with the city didn't match the fact that they had created an LLC. So what often happens is <clears throat> if you initially started out as a sole proprietor with the city, you could convert to a more formal type of business structure, such as an LLC or corporation in the future, what you would need to do at that point is, you know, first create your LLC or corporation and then return to San Francisco and close out your sole proprietorship account and then re-register under the LLC or the corporation. And that does happen. So sometimes people know, you know, oh, my tax person suggested, or maybe they even created the LLC or tax or corporation for them, but then they failed to make any changes to their San Francisco. So you definitely always want to be on top of your filings um, and making sure that they match uh, because that could affect your um, being able to get loans or grants in the future. So if you're going that route, um, that would be your first step is you have to basically essentially create your LLC or corporation. You're going to give it a name. Uh, we do encourage you to search the name that you uh, come up with your corporation, corporation or LLC. And we give you a couple of uh, websites here that you should search for the name. Uh, you know, you don't want to file um, anything the same or too similar, particularly if it's in the same line of business um, and in the same area. Uh, that could be rejected one, but also you could be infringing on somebody else's name rights and they might end up sending you a letter to cease and desist. So the more that you can stay away from anything too similar, same type of business in the same area, the better. But so that's your first thing is search for the name, confirm it's available, then go about filing these forms with the state. Uh, the state usually will take about, their processing times vary. Um, they have information on their website about their processing times. And just to show you, let's see if I could switch over to their um, website. This is the California Secretary of State. Um, and this is where they now have a new online filing system that you would file. Uh, if you click here, let's see, actually. Um, yeah, if you click here, it'll be search uh, for the name here. And again, this website is on my checklist. Uh, you click on this search uh, on the left, and the idea being that you go down here and you type in the name that you're thinking of giving your LLC or corporation search, and it'll pull up uh, a list, um, and you'll go through that list uh, and see if there's anything exactly the same or too similar, um, but that's the idea there. Uh, we also recommend you check um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website. This is where people file trademarks, um, so if you really want legal protection name or mark, um, you would file a, a trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And so you'll check, you'll go to this website. Again, it's on the checklist and you'll search trademarks. Um, same kind of idea. You'll just type it in 
And um, I usually just recommend this basic word mark search that gives you a good indication. You'll click search, it'll populate um, or not if there's nothing similar. But that's, um, that's essentially what you wanna do when you are searching your name. And that would be your first step is to file the articles of organization or articles of incorporation. And then the next step in that case would be to obtain a tax ID number for your LLC or corporation from the IRS. So again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we sole individuals, sole proprietors would have a social security number. Um, these entities, corporations or LLCs will have a what's called an EIN, employer identification number. And they obtain this from the IRS. So this can be done online for free. Um, you go to irs.gov. This is their website here. Best thing for you to do is just go to their main site, irs.gov, and type in EIN in their search field and click enter. And you apply for an employer identification number online. You'll click there. It'll give you some information about determining your eligibility. But essentially, down here, you'll find another button that says apply online now. You'll click there and it'll take you through an online application. Um, that again, you'll see who's applying. Is it a sole proprietorship? Is it a corporation or is it LLC? A sole proprietor with no employees does not need an EIN, but we do get oftentimes sole proprietors that might do like business to business where uh, they're being asked to provide their uh, tax number. And rather than give out your social to many people, because you want to try to protect your social, uh, you could obtain an EIN as a sole proprietor that doesn't necessarily need one, uh, but rather for business to business purposes, uh, you might need to provide someone a tax number. Uh, like uh, if you're getting paid as a 1099, this happens a lot with like independent contractors. Um, if you're an independent writer and you're you know, working and writing for multiple publications and they're needing to pay you, they will likely want to pay you using mine and rather give out your... In that case, you could obtain um, this EIN. It's free to obtain, again, and you get it within just a few minutes. Um, so that would be your second step. In this case, in this example, if you are going forward with a corporation or LLC. And then once you have those two steps done, then the next step is if your entity is operating in San Francisco, you will need to uh, register with the city. And this is done with our tax office, um, which is at City Hall in room 140 as well. So same office that we're in, but we're separate from them. Um, again, this is required of anyone who does business in San Francisco. And generally our rule is anyone engaged in business in San Francisco, seven, any part of seven or more days in a fiscal year. So the city, we operate on a fiscal calendar. So we're in our fourth quarter. Um, our new year will begin July 1st. So if you will be operating seven days, um, the rest of this fiscal year, you will need to be registered uh, with us. And that's again, with the tax office, The they also have an online business registration application. It's done in three steps. You're going to uh, go onto their website and complete an application, and you're going to sign. It's a DocuSign form, and then you're going to pay. Um, the fees vary type of business, um, the start date, and your estimated gross receipts. So on the, um, let's see if I can go to their website. Yeah, so this is the Office of the Treasurer Tax Collector website. You're going to click here where it says business, register a business, and the new business registration is here. So again, here there's information about our year again, July 1st through June 30th. Anybody who is registering now will pay a fee for the current year, which is you know, valid through June 30th, and we'll likely also see a fee for the upcoming year. And so you could pay both fees now and be current until June 30th of 2023, or you could pay the current year fee and you can renew by May 31st of this year uh, for the following year fee. But you will see both um, fees at this point now if you're registering now. So, um, You'll click on the new business registration, and these are the various parts of the application. In um, my presentation, I actually have screenshots of all of this, but I think you know we don't have a lot of time to go through it all. We'll mail you that or email the, the presentation, and you'll see the screenshots. You can also just go through this without submitting, <clears throat> so feel free to do that. But again, one of your first questions here is sole proprietor, etc. Um, so that's your San Francisco business registration. The one thing that I also wanted to point out here is how much does it cost to register? So again, the fee is based on 
Estimated gross receipts, there's going to be a question on the application that asks you to estimate your gross receipts. And when it asks this question, it's going to ask it in the form of they want you to estimate your gross receipts for the current calendar year. So if you are registering now, you would estimate what you expect to gross between now and the end of December. And if it's anywhere between zero and 100,000, it'll either be $52 or $43 plus a $4 state fee. And the difference between Schedule A and Schedule B is based on business. So there's only three business types <clears throat> that fall under Schedule B. And those are uh, retail, wholesale, and something called certain services. Everything else falls under Schedule A. Um, so it would be 52 plus $4 for the current fiscal year. If you get into some of these higher um, gross receipts and gross between now and December, over $100,000, um, then your fee would be the, let's say the 86 amount at, at this point, because we are in the fourth quarter, that $86 amount will be prorated and you would pay 25% of the fee. So all of the fees except the minimum amounts are prorated at this point because we are at the fourth quarter of our year, and that talks about it right here. There's information about that. 25% of the fee except the minimum amount. Um, so you will renew that annually in May. Um, that's your business registration. Also, if you do business under a different name, you, you uh, would have to file what we call a fictitious business name. And this is done with the county clerk's office of San Francisco. Now, what does that mean exactly? So if I am going to register as a sole proprietor and I'm gonna open up my phone. Um, so my registration will be under my name, Marta Yanez, when I register, but I'm, I'm gonna name my nail salon Fancy Nail or something like that. So I would register at the time of filling out my San Francisco business registration, actually, I will want to confirm that the name is available. And so if you actually, let me go back to our checklist really quick. If you look here, we have now three websites that we recommend that you search for the name, um, including the county clerk's office website. Uh, so let me see. Yeah, so that's this office website, office of the county clerk. This is where you will officially file your fictitious business name after you register your business. Um, so you do want to ensure that you are searching for the name and making sure again that it's available. So before I had suggested that you check with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website, the Secretary of State website, and now I'm also suggesting that you check the county clerk's database of registered businesses. Um, or fictitious names. So similarly, there'll be a place to where you can search by name. Uh, if it's available, let's say Fancy Nail is available, I would go ahead and register my business first. There's gonna be down here called location details where I would input my business name because I'm comfortable, I've searched and it's available. So I'll register my business first and then I would be able to file my fictitious business name statement um, form with the office of the county clerk. This, once you do the fictitious name, a statement filing, um, your name is valid for five years, uh, but part of filing a fictitious name requires that you not only file a form with the county clerk's office, but also you have to publish the name in a newspaper. And that is a requirement. And so the fee to file uh, with the county clerk's office is $58. That's for one um, person doing business under one name. If you, and same if you're a corporation or an LLC, a lot of times LLCs, when you, when you create an LLC, your name, the name of your LLC legally has to have LLC at the end of the name. Um, actually, let me stop real quick because I know we're already at two o'clock and I think this is only scheduled for two, but can we go over a little bit? Yes, ten. Okay, so I will try not to keep you guys too much longer. Like I said, just feel free to follow up because um, I know this was only scheduled for an hour. But um, real quickly, so you'll file a fictitious name form and then you'll publish the name. Once you do that, again, the name is valid for five years. Whereas again, the business registration needs to be renewed every May. The, the name, as long as there's no changes to the name and no changes to the address on the name or uh, yeah, the address on the name, then you, um, that will be valid for five years. Uh, well, one thing that I was saying with respect to LLCs, so LLCs have to have an LLC at the end of it. So it's like fancy nail LLC. Let's say that's what I'm gonna name my LLC, but my shop name is just gonna be fancy nail. Then I would still need to file a fictitious business name because at that point, fancy nail LLC is now doing business as fancy nail. 
And so the only way to avoid that is I would have to have like LLC on my signage at my shop after Fancy Nail. So um, I know it's again, a lot of information, but going forward. So after you do that, this next box here talks about that sometimes there's additional permits and licenses that are required. Um, this depends on the type of business that you do. Uh, some businesses will have additional, what we call regulatory permits and licenses that regulate your actual business activity. So what we do on the back side or the, this side of the um, checklist, let me see if I could. So this is our checklist on the right hand side, we provide you a list of some local agencies, um, state and federal and give you like an idea of um, of the permits that they administer so for instance, if you are a restaurant or you're going to be opening up a restaurant in San Francisco, besides maybe all of the stuff on the left hand of this checklist or the front side of the checklist, you would additionally need permits from the San Francisco Health Department. Um, they license and give, uh, yeah, license food establishments essentially. Um, besides that, if you have outdoor tables and chairs, in that example, I'm opening up a cafe. I'm gonna have, you know, my business is gonna be registered. I'm gonna get health permits from the health department. But if I want outdoor seating, uh, I would also need permits from the Department of Public Works. And in fact, right now we have a another program called Shared Space. So that's something that. Um, came about during the pandemic to try to help a lot of our businesses operate outdoors. So the city provided a free permit for business that businesses could apply for to operate in the sidewalk or in the parking lane. And so I'm sure you've seen uh, various little things built out on the parking lane. Um, that's a program called Shared Space and businesses can still apply for that free, I believe right now in November, the people who have had those permits will need to reapply by November. Some of them will be allowed to continue. Uh, there's many modifications and make them more accessible. Um, and some of them might need to go away completely. It just depends on safety. Um, and then in that example, sticking with my example of the cafe, you I would also need a, um, a seller's permit. And so this is now under the state column and it's under the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. So uh, anytime you are selling a tangible item, um, food included, if you're having a sit down service, you need a California seller's permit. And this is free from the state. The idea being that um, you are going to be reporting to the state what your sales have been usually quarterly, and then you will um, pay what you've collected in sales tax. So that's why you don't necessarily pay to obtain this permit. It's rather like pay as you go and um, you obtain it for free because you're gonna become like a, a tax collector essentially for the state. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea if you're selling alcohol um, in that example, again, cafe, I wanna sell beer and wine. I would also need ABC uh, permits from the Alcohol Beverage Control Agency. That's again, at another state agency. Um, so that gives you an idea, but again, it's always best to, to come in and talk to us um, if you're not sure, if you don't clearly see, and this is another thing. In San Francisco, we have uh, very innovative people. They're always you know, coming up with new business ideas that sometimes we're having to research what might be necessary for what you're proposing to do. Uh, so not everything is gonna be addressed. Um, always, but that's another service that our office offers. Yet you, if you have a, a particular type of business, you don't see anybody that has that business and you're not sure what's required, definitely reach out and we can do um, some of that research for you. What we'll end up doing usually is reaching out to some of our uh, city agencies and asking uh, them uh, what might be required or if they, if they that might fall under their uh, jurisdiction or their code in some way, um, whatever you're proposing to do. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about, and Assessor uh, Torres did already mention, um, taxes. So a little bit about our taxes in San Francisco. We have um, a general business tax uh, that some businesses will pay. A lot of our small businesses will be exempt from our general business taxes. Um, we have a small business exemption that essentially, if you gross less than $2 million, um, and then you might not have to pay the city's general tax. Um, however, there is the business property tax, which he had talked about. And actually, I, I just realized that the rate that I have here on my slides is, is a little higher. So it's gone down for current year. 
Um, and then we also have some special third party taxes. These apply to certain businesses. So like if you're a hotel operator or a parking lot operator, you will um, have this additional tax that you have to collect from your customer and you're gonna be remitting that and uh, reporting and remitting that to the city. Uh, Otherwise, a lot of our small businesses will uh, be exempt from the city's general business tax and all, and may only um, have to pay their annual business registration. Um, and uh, if they have property values over 4,000, uh, they may also have this business uh, property tax that they is due to the city. Um, so I think I will stop there and... Um, this is the rest of my presentation. It goes through like these screenshots of how to organize your LLC. Um, I went on their websites a little bit already to give you an idea, but uh, these are all the actual um, screenshots of the, the um, questions that you'll see there. So again, we'll email you all this, um, the employer identification number, the, um, let's see, business registration. So this talks a little bit more about who needs to be registered in San Francisco. And then it has a fee schedule again. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Then the screenshots of the actual business registration application. And um, what else do I have after this? That's a long one. Oh, I do want to mention there is a program right now, um, first year free. Again, this is the city's um, attempt at trying to get businesses to start up in San Francisco again. So if you are a business that's going to be opening up on a ground floor commercial uh, storefront, um, and we're basically trying to get, you know, some of our, vac our vacancies filled, our ground floor vacancies. And so if you are a business that's going to be uh, operating on the ground floor and you are a small business, um, you may qualify for this first year free. So, and what this does, essentially, it'll waive not only your business registration fees, but also your, like in my example of a cafe, it'll waive your health permit application, your health license fee for the first year. Um, if you are needing to remodel uh, the space, um, it will waive any of your building permit fees from the city, including signed permit fees. So typically when you are going into a space, um, depending on the space, right, you've confirmed that the use permits or that the zoning, um, the location permits the use. Again, by checking with the planning department, you'll want to check and make sure that that that, um, that that is okay. And actually I do have this on zoning. So this is a place where you can also check yourself whether a location is allowed. Um, I'm sorry, whether a particular type of business would be allowed at the given location that you're considering. Um, there's also this other tool called Symbium uh, Build for Business. Actually, let me go to their website. Yeah, so this is better. Um, you can go to sfplanning.org, find my zoning. If you have a location in mind, you could uh, plug in the address here. You kind of have to be though, uh, able to kind of read the zoning control tables. Um, so you would plug in an address and it'll pull up the zoning and it'll have these zoning control tables that essentially kind of tell you what's permitted or not permitted. So like here, for instance, um, this is a, a zoning district called NC1. The address is 218 Fillmore. And this might be a little outdated, but um, essentially a gym. If you were trying to open up a gym at this location, you see this P here, that means it's permitted on the, this is controlled by story. So this is first story, second story, third story. So of course a gym would not be permitted and P means not permitted on the second or third story, but on the first story, yes. Hotel not permitted in this zoning district um, and so forth. So you'll see that, uh, that's why I say you kind of have to be, um, able to, to do that. Otherwise, um, if you want something a little, uh, little bit more easy, if you scroll down on this page, um, there's going to be the section that says Symbian Build for Business. This is a good tool to use as like a starting point, but I would always recommend that you confirm by checking with the planning department or checking with us that what you're seeing here is going to be uh, accurate. So here you can search by location if you had a location in mind, or you can search by business if you kind of just want to generally know uh, where you might be able to open up um, a bar. It's, it's not letting me do this. Um, you can you know, look at search by business, type in bar, or if you have a location in mind, you can click the address okay, here. 
Uh, so like bar, let's say, well, it's not gonna let me do it. It's a little slow. Um, I think my internet is slow, but um, okay, to save time, just know that that's there. There's also um, a new website that, where you can apply for permits. Um, so to the extent, like, let's say you find a location, you confirm the zoning, but if that had not already been a bar, maybe that space was, um, maybe that space was a retail store and you're converting it into a bar. And that would be considered a change of use. And typically changes of uses require a building permit to be pulled from the building department. And in this case, um, it would also require architectural plans because now you're putting a food facility in a space that hasn't been a food facility. So I always tell people in order to save time and money, if you are looking to uh, open up something, look to open in a space that was maybe already operated in the same way or same type of business. Otherwise you will likely go through the process of having to do a change of use and um, requiring building permits, requiring architectural plans. And so that will just, you know, further delay how quickly you can open up there. But uh, with this first year free program though, uh, a lot of those fees will be waived, which is great uh, right now. And that's for anybody that's registering between now and October of this year, um, or actually, yeah, it started for anybody who registered um, between November 1st of last year and October 31st of this year. And as long as your gross, uh, your estimated gross receipts will be under two million and it's not a formula retail business, meaning it's not a chain, um, then you will likely be eligible for this and have a lot of your fees, your first year fees waived. So there's information about that. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, I do have information about ADA. Um, so yeah, you definitely want to consider accessibility in a space that you might be looking to rent um, that's going to be uh, accessible to the public. Generally, your entrance should be accessible. So if you clearly see there's a step or the entrance is a little too narrow or something, you'll want to, uh, what we're recommending is that you would hire somebody called a certified access specialist. It's um, it's generally an architect with a special certification in accessibility, and they would do come in and do an inspection and kind of outline for you what you might need to do to remove barriers to access. Maybe sometimes that's just in, installing an automatic door opener or somehow removing that step. Um, right now, we are we do have a grant to help pay for that inspection. If you are a business. Um, there's also another program called the Accessible Business Entrance Program, where property owners are being required by the city to, um, to comply by submitting a checklist, which basically tells the city uh, their, about their property and um, what tier they fall under, whether they need to make uh, modifications. What we're finding is a lot of property owners are putting this burden on the small business tenant. And if that is you, um, the city has this ADA inspection that can help pay for that inspection up to $1,000 uh, by a CASP inspection to comply with the accessible business entrance program or up to $3,000 for a full CASP. So unfortunately, a lot of our businesses are being sued for lack of uh, compliance uh, with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is really a sweeping civil rights law that says that you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities, period. And so um, we have been trying to uh, educate the business community about ways that they can reduce their risk of being sued. And one of the ways is to this inspection done by this CASP inspector. Uh, there's also another grant that we have open right now to help for, with design services. So if you are needing to make modifications and you're gonna need to have plans to submit to the building department, um, you can apply for up to $5,000 uh, of architectural services. The city will find you the architect to work with and have um, them do your plans. And then later, there's also going to be a construction grant to help you actually do the work that needs to be done. So they just that. Um, and then this last slide, finally, our business resources. So again, a lot of technical service providers that can help you with entrepreneurship training, business planning, uh, coaching. So you'll find a list of those here. We also have some financial resources. Um, Main Street Launch is administering a loan for the city. Um, so you could check those out there. And there's a, a few other, these are community lenders um, or what we call nonprofit lenders. So ideally, you, if you are starting to do 
uh, can go to uh, your lender, a bank that you might already be banking with and try to get a, a small business loan from them. But what we'll find oftentimes if you are a new business, that's not gonna be available for you. And so these um, community lenders are another option. Um, but because they are an alternative option, their interest rate is usually a little bit higher. Um, but we have had some programs at zero interest. Um, so take a look at that and then our legal resources. So I will, um, with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing. And I know we've gone over and hopefully take some questions. I'm, I'm happy to stay on, I can stay on, um, but I also don't wanna keep people too, too long. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks, Martha. That was so good. You're such a wealth of information. There's so much information. And I know I talk fast and I apologize. But um, like I said, we do try to make ourselves accessible. So feel free to follow up directly if you do want uh, more one on one or have additional questions. Great. Um, I, I think there are just a couple of questions. Okay. Um, Early on, someone said that they had trouble reaching someone to answer a question in real time. And I think the form that she submitted was on the treasurer and tax collector website. Mm. Is there a, a, a way of reaching someone in real time and, and just asking a question? Um, so if it is a question related to the office of the treasurer and tax collector, that's going to be more difficult. Um, you could always try 311. So 311, the city's um, kind of call customer service call center is uh, does answer calls in real time. Uh, depending on what your question is, they might be able to answer it right then and there, or they might need to send a message to someone in the tax office to get back to you. Um, you can also try our office. Uh, we are limited in staff though. So oftentimes, like right now, I'm actually uh, on my is supposed to be on answering call duty. <laughs> but as you know, I'm here in this presentation. So during this time, I haven't been able to answer the calls. And so that means nobody else is answering the calls either right now. Um, but if you leave a message, we do check that. I'll be doing that right after this, checking messages and trying to get back to people. We try to be really responsive and get back to people either same day or next day um, through our office. And we may be able to help you if it's a tax related question, or we might need to um, have you reach out to them directly. But I think also if it is a tax related question, they do have a, um, uh, on their on their website, they have a help get help or a help center. And my understanding is that if you submit um, through that link uh, before seven, they're supposed to get back to you same day as well. Thank you. Um, someone had a question. Can you renew online? And when you renew, do you have to renew both the DBA and business license? Um, so yes, you can renew the business registration online, and that's the one that is due every May by the last day of May. Um, I believe the tax office is sending out notices this week about the renewal. Um, so some businesses will receive one notice and others will receive other notices. So for instance, my understanding is that if you're a small business that reported uh, gross receipts less than 50,000 last year and you have zero employees, you will receive a bill that you just need to pay. However, if you are not that um, in your larger business, you will receive a notice instructing you how to go online and complete an actual renewal where you have to answer questions about what your gross receipts were, and then it will be billed or you, your fee will be based on that information that you're reporting. Um, there's also some businesses that are exempt organizations, so like nonprofits, and provided that they are still exempt, they might not need to do anything. So they'll receive a different type of notice. But yes, the tax office, uh, I believe just this week is starting to send out those notices. And yeah, you will either um, go online and, and complete a renewal or you'll just need to pay a bill online. Um, and no, it does not renew your fictitious name. Those are two different things with two different city departments. So fictitious names are done through the county clerk's office and those are valid for five years. So depending on kind of where you're at, at what year you're at, you might still have time remaining on that or you might need to renew soon. So um, you would want to check with the county clerk's office actually on their website. I believe if you have a fictitious name, you can search and you'll likely find yours and you'll be able to see the date that you filed and then you'll know kind of roughly when it's due and for that one you will not be able to renew online the fictitious name you will need to file a brand new uh, fictitious name statement form and that one is done in person at city hall or by mail uh, to the county clerk's office okay thank you Such a yeah. answer. Um, so another question is can we change from llc to sole proprietorship um, at any time 
Um, yeah, my, my sense is that, yes, you can always switch your structure. I think um, a tax professional might be uh, might recommend that you stay in one structure for that tax year. So maybe not change mid year, um, but that is something that you'll want to discuss with the tax professional. But generally, my understanding is that you probably can change at any time and convert. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, someone else asked, the seller's permit application asks for an S EIN. Is that the same as the EIN? They ask separately for the federal EIN. Yeah, I believe it's different. It's one issued by the state, and I'm actually less familiar with that, to be honest with you. Um, but yes, I believe it's a state employer number. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, well, and we are almost at time. Well, we are at time, actually. But I know, we're over time. I apologize. It's so good, Martha. Thank you so much for covering all that information. Of course. Yeah, no, it's been my pleasure. And I'm excited to work with you guys as you um, think about starting a business here. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll send you guys all this information and my contact is there. So feel free to reach out. Email is always the best um, in terms of reaching out because like I said, usually uh, there's one of us in the office. So we only over, there's two of us right now at the office and we overlap only one day a week. So the other days um, we might be assisting clients at the counter. And so again, not able to pick up the phone or not able to, um, to help you if you were to walk in. So usually if you're trying to come in, it's best to schedule an appointment. Um, otherwise, email is really good. Feel free to email and we'll reach back out as soon as we become available. What is the email address? So the main, um, our office main email address is SFOSB. It stands for San Francisco Office Small Business at sfgov.org. Okay. Someone and or my to... email is, um, is on the presentation slides too. Perfect. So I will be sending Martha's slides to everyone along with yeah. a link to the recording so you can review it. And again, I wanna thank Martha so much. That was fantastic. And I hope you uh, reach out to the Office of Small Business and also to the library too for all your research needs. But um, yes, a lot of thank yous coming in uh, chat, Martha. Awesome, yay, thank you. Thank you all. So look for that email from me. And again, I just wanna thank Martha and uh, happy Small Business Week, everyone. Yeah, happy Small Business Week, everyone. Okay, thanks. Okay, Thank you, take care, of course. Okay, bye.